So again, um, thanks for coming here. Um, please like this video, subscribe if you want to be notified of more. I'm kind of really new at this. I don't really, I'm not much of a influencer, so I don't, you know, there's all kinds of jargon and things, reminders, like hit the subscribe button if you want reminders that um, a new video has been popped up and you want to follow any of these. Don't forget to go down and look at the playlists. There's a, a Revelation playlist, for instance, um, not hotly visited because, you know, I was just kind of posting them here and I wasn't really advertising them or anything but you know take a look at those if you want a, a deeper dive into the book of revelation we'll get into all of that um the, the seals the trumpets and, and bowls as well as the three woes the antichrist babylon mystery babylon all of that uh we get into so anyway with that um let's take a look here if you have your bible open now I'm, I, right now i've got open um, for no particular reason other than, you know, it's it's an okay version and stuff, and it's one that I'm used to. I've got the New King James open, and I'm using Bible Gateway um, on my computer because it's handy and it's free, and it's something you can do too. So you can open up BibleGateway.com, and you can type in a Bible reference, and you can scroll um, the pages right to left to advance chapters and into books and things. So it's a it's a valuable little tool. If you'd like to do that or open up your paper Bible and that's one I always prefer it's like the feel and the smell of a book and it's never going to get deleted someday although somebody might try to conf confiscate it right so with that Matthew 23 Matthew 23 so Jesus is in the temple um, he's he is um, going to be spending this whole chapter castigating the scribes and Pharisees. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. You know, heaping all kinds of burdens on him and so forth. And, and um, you know, we all know the stories of um, the scribes and Pharisees and, and the way they are with people and their, their hypocrisy and so forth and he this is what he's doing is he's in the temple and he's beating them up for this <clears throat> now when you look at the all of that discourse in luke his sermon in luke is very much this and it's from inside the temple in luke he's in the temple so don't try to sit down with luke and with matthew 24 and try to harmonize these all of it discourses because uh, you will come to some weird, wrong conclusions, and it'll mess up your theology and some of your timing and so forth. And you can tell that by, by going into one chapter early in Luke and then read, and it shows that he's in the temple and so forth, and then watch down to the end. So, um, <clears throat> so he's talking about all these bad things that are going to happen to you. Uh, let's, let's look at verse 31 because I don't want to blow the whole chapter off. I'm just giving you context of what's being spoken of here because I, I want to get to the Olivet Discourse, which is on the Mount of Olives. Here they're in the temple right before they walk out. Okay, Verse 31, therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Wow. That's not very loving, Jesus. Who are you to judge? <laughs> that was Jesus. And so sometimes when we call out false prophets, false teachers, we're told we shouldn't be judge, judging. That's not very loving. That's not very Christian-like. Well, here's Jesus. We're just emulating Christ. He does not have much tolerance for false teachers who deceive people and lead people astray. So this is what he's doing here. He says, verse 34, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. As surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now here he's saying this generation and he's speaking specifically uh, to the Pharisees 
and the scribes and a certain group of people. And especially of a certain attitude in that they're false teachers, vipers, and so forth. So this generation is a term, comes up in the next chapter. But again, you have to look at context, context, context. Okay? Here, clearly, he's speaking to people in you brood of vipers and this generation, this is going to happen to you. This is coming upon you. So he's addressing the you. And um, that, so these things will come upon this generation. So he's speaking to, directly to some people here. Does it mean the same thing in the next chapter? Some maintain, well, yeah, it's exactly the same. Well, it's not always the same. Throughout the rest of the Bible, it's not always the same. Again, you have to look at the context and see what things he's addressing and who he's talking to and, and all that. You've got to look at the context. It's very important. Okay, so now, if we look down, see this Bible Gateway is pretty cool. Click on this. It's a hyperlink, and it'll take you into chapter 24. Jesus predict, predicts the destruction of the temple. Now, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So there, there we verify what I uh, was asserting in the previous chapter 23. He was in the temple. Then Jesus went out and departed from the, the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Well, let's pause right there briefly. So we're doing verse by verse. We're going to pause a lot, okay? But we're going to verify some things and set the context. When you go to Mark 13, you find out it's uh, Peter, James, John and Andrew. So there were four of his disciples with him. I don't know where the rest of them were. If they decided to go, you know, shopping, go find a good meal somewhere. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure they didn't go to Starbucks. But wherever they went, uh, they weren't there. It was just four disciples. Mark 13. So, uh, they exit. They go up on the Mount of Olives. And... The disciples are looking at it. It's just a beautiful scene. Probably torch lights everywhere and lanterns and things. And it's looking very beautiful. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? In other words, all the things he's talking about, right? Do you not see all these things? And he's looking around also at the temple with them. And he says, Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Not one stone. Not one stone. Stone. What about that Temple Mount? Are there any stones up there? Ancient stones? Even the cobblestones in the ground are ancient. You may have heard this assertion before, and you may not. But the so-called Temple Mount that everybody is up on right now, the stones are still there because that was not the Temple Mount. That was a Roman garrison up there. And there's a lot of history behind that, and you can. Um, find books about it and so forth. Now, tradition for several hundred years now, not for thousands of years, but just for hundreds of years, and the tradition comes from the background from the Knights Templar and, and uh, the Inqu Inquisitors and all those folks from the Roman Catholic Church who went and conquered the Muslims and the Jews. They were not kind to the Jews that were still in the land as you know Bedouins and wanderers at the time. And um, they found this building up there, the Dome of the Rock. And um, they declared that that was the place where the temple was. They, they kind of made a declaration that stuck. I think it was like a, a military, like a major or somebody like that. It's, it, it was an officer, an officer in the army that um, took over that land at the time in Jerusalem. and took it back from the Muslims. And uh, they kind of made a declaration because they wanted to rally the troops and get everybody excited and say, good, let's keep going. And they started going after the Jews after they took care of the Muslims and started routing them. So they, for hundreds of years now, they've declared the so-called Temple Mount as the place where the temple was. But study on your own. Go back and look at Solomon. Look at the read, read um, Kings and so forth. And you'll see that the command was that Solomon should build the temple where? In the city of David. City of David is about a quarter mile away down the hill, a little bit further down. That's where historically where the temple was. When the command was uh, came from um, Nero and so forth, and it, it first started in Titus, 
and they started taking over Jerusalem in 70 AD, um, they burned the temple. And nobody stood in the temple and declared himself God or came up with a beast system. So that part didn't happen in 70 AD. Um, they burned the temple, and as we know, we read the descriptions of the temple, it was lined inside with much gold. Well, what ended up happening when it, when it burned down is, and the Romans sacked the city after they conquered the city, they, and it took some time, they went in and the Roman soldiers started taking their spears and, and popping up and plowing under, popping up the rocks. So that's why not one stone was left on another. Um, it's not like they ran over it with tanks or whatever. They were after the gold, and the gold was in the ground. They, had, they knocked walls down. They pulled up the stones, and they threw them, and they threw them over the side and whatever they had to do. And um, they were getting at the melted gold in the ground that melted between the stones and down into the ground. So not one stone was left upon another, just as Jesus said. And that is not the Temple Mount. For us, it doesn't matter. Um, we know... The church, the body of Christ, is the real temple right now. We are indwelt by very God himself. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer today. The only reason why temple and a third temple is important or significant to us is because it's the fulfillment of prophecy. We know that we're really close to the end because you've got to have the abomination of desolation, as Daniel said, and Jesus will say later on here in this chapter. So when you see the abomination of desolation, and he's speaking future tense. Um, so we know that, well, you've got to have an abomination of desolation in, before you have the, in Daniel chapter 9, the the stopping of the sacrifices. You've got to have sacrifices. So you've got to have a temple and you've got to have a holy of holies to desecrate. And you've got to have sacrifice. So the temple's got to be there. So that's why we get excited for, for, for the fulfillment of prophecy. The third temple really means nothing to the believer. Per se, we, we're, we're not necessarily endorsing that there should be a temple, we should have temple worship. All those things are fulfilled in Christ. The sacrifices um, were of no particular value um, other than they were a, a covering for sin. And it, they all looked forward to the coming Messiah. And, but the Messiah has come. Here, an important announcement, folks. It's the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't what did it. It was the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. That, that takes away the sins of the world. So that's been done. All those things that were, were typologies, see, there's some symbolism in the Bible. We're told, though, it's symbolic, and we're told what it means. And we're told after the fact, this is what it meant. Paul tells us regularly, as a, a former Pharisee, uh, he could speak to it very well and explain to the Gentiles who he was writing to, because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He's explaining what the meaning of these things are. Uh, what and and those who were clinging to their their um their sabbaths and their circumcisions and so forth who was explaining about here was the meaning of it and it's you know you're set apart for God and that you know and he's so he's explaining the meaning that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament to give us um, what Jesus did in with the new covenant so the temple in and of itself means nothing more than a fulfillment of um, prophecy. Now, we could discuss a fourth temple. We could discuss Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. Um, again, some um, classes of eschatological believers will say that that's all symbolic. Well, that's eight chapters of detailed symbolism, including telling you where all the closets are, where the... Where the um, the musicians in the temple are supposed to keep their instruments and so forth. I mean, it's, to say that that's symbolic is... Sorry, it says in the, also elsewhere in the Bible that Branch himself, who Branch is a messianic reference, Jesus himself is going to build that temple. So there will be a fourth massively huge temple during the millennium. And we can get into that and get into all the reasons why, but the, the temple and, and all of the... Ten Commandments, all the things, and, and, and the observances and the feast days were all pointed to Christ and to all teach us that you're not going to get to heaven on your own works. Can't do it. You break the law in one point, you've broken the whole law. Um, a break is a break. Doesn't matter if you've chipped off a corner or if you've cracked the thing in two. A break is a break. You've broken the law. 
So it's the it, the law is a schoolmaster to teach us that we we need a savior, and so that's what the whole point was, and that's what the temple's for. That's what the the feast days were to point to Christ, and the ways in which he fulfilled them. That's kind of what we're looking for right now, because he fulfilled the spring feasts and on up through the feast of weeks, and now we just kind of wait to see what happens with the um, the fall feasts, which have yet to be fulfilled. So, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, the Jews will probably build a third temple up there on the so-called Temple Mount. No matter. I mean, they could build it in downtown Los Angeles or in the South Pole for all that matters and all we care. Well, other than we care because we know it's got to be Jerusalem. But you know what I mean is it's not uh, on any holy level or or level that, that means anything to um, us. It, it doesn't mean anything other than the fulfillment of prophecy. I would, yeah, although God would have had to have written the whole Bible differently because it talks about Jerusalem. But I hope you get my point. I'm speaking hyperbolically here now. Speaking hyperbole, okay? Exaggerative language to make a point, okay? Jesus answered and said to them in, in verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end isn't yet. We say it yet. Okay? For nation will rise against nation. Now the word for nation there is ethnos, ethnicities, okay? So it doesn't have to do with countries. That's that's elsewhere in here. That's kingdoms, okay? Are we having ethnic wars right now? We've we've had them a lot. We have, boy, uh, you know, um, South Africa and um, here in the United States, race wars and so forth. And the Chechens being attacked elsewhere. And I mean, it happens. You, you, you have ethnic cleansing. You have them from country to country in Africa and uh, in uh, Korea. And uh, it, it's, you know, bad news. You always have the bad blood between the Japanese and the Chinese. So, okay, ethnic wars, ethnos. Nation will rise against nation. Eth ethnicities will rise against ethnicities. And kingdom against kingdoms. Kingdoms are different governments, different government uh, or countries, okay? And there will be famines, pestilences. Yeah, we just went through a big deal there, um, and it was a big, mostly fake deal, it turns out, right? Many people knew at the time it was happening that this doesn't smell right, I don't think. But anyway, um, I think that's kind of a some conditioning going on and that there will be more, okay? But these things will happen. And earthquakes, we've always had earthquakes in various places, um, diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So it's like birth pains, the beginning of sorrows, sorrows, birth pains. And how does birth pains, how do they start? How do they build? Well, they build. They, they increase in intensity, and earthquakes and things have been increasing in, in uh, intensity, and they get closer and closer together. And so we are seeing that. We're seeing earthquakes pop up in weird places where there have not necessarily been before, and there are increasing all over the world in intensity as well as the volcanic activity and so forth, um, and uh, the, all the different types of diseases and things that are going on all over the world. Um, you know, yes, we've, we've always had those, yeah, but, you know, like birth pangs, this, this is just the beginning, Jesus said, and, and indeed, in our lifetime, we can see that it's increased over what our parents would say if we were talking to our parents or grandparents, and they'd said, you know, we've always had that, and people have always said that Jesus is coming any day now. They've always said that. Um, you know, anybody who thought Jesus was going to come and that the events in Revelation were going to come before about 1980 or so, they were simply wrong. Why? Well, for instance, you've got the two witnesses, and the two witnesses, when they're killed in the streets, they lay in the streets for, you know, in the fourth day there, three and a half days later, put it properly, um, the Lord raises them up on their feet. They're raised up on their feet to come back to life and they ascend into heaven and the whole world sees it. How would before the 
a cable or a satellite, and especially now with cell phones and things, how would the whole world watch that going on? That was not going to happen back in the day, trust me. You know, and I was alive back then in the 60s and 70s. There's no way the whole world's going to watch and see all that happening live. It was difficult enough trying to get the whole world to try to see the moon landing, and, and that was some really bad photography, right? So anyway, um, and also uh, it couldn't happen any day because we still had um, the Jews that had to come back and return into the land. I'm not sure how quickly that could have happened. You know, they're still coming over. They, they started earnestly and truly, and, and, and they had their own land that was called Israel again. Uh, 1948, before that, it was not called Israel. They didn't have their little tiny piece of land that's grown since then, but they didn't have that called Israel. But Israel had to be established again, and they had to start coming into it. And since then, people have been trickling in from all over the world. All those things would have had to have happened um, for that to come true. So there's still some more things that um, had to happen. You might. The next question is, Dave, is there anything else that needs to come true that needs to happen? Um, uh, maybe. Not for, not for the rapture, not for the second coming. Anything else that needs to be done, um, it can happen quickly. That all the temple implements, for instance, they've all been made. They've all been crafted. Uh, most of the stones, they're all warehoused. Um, the cedar boards and so forth are all warehoused. It's ready to go. Netanyahu said a few years ago that they know right where the... Um, Ark of the Covenant is, and they're ready to retrieve it. Um, there's some speculation that lies under old Jerusalem, and they, they use special equipment to do soundings behind some walls and things that have yet to be excavated. And they say, we've, we already know right exactly where it is, and when the time comes, we, we will go and retrieve it. That's from what Netanyahu said. He's not just some quack, um, not some YouTuber, um, you know, speculating. Um, yeah, so anyway... Um, they've got all of the Levitical priests enough to get things rolling. They've got trained now. They have recently um, declared that they have their high priest ready to go. So everything's ready to go as far as that goes. So nothing really has to happen for all these events here in the end. So, so move on. That's the beginning of sorrows. It's the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Oh, that's the next thing that happens. Okay, so um, all these events are going to build and build and build, and then we have a break and see the in the white space there maybe in the white space here. Then you have you have rapture. That's another study. Prove the rapture. There is no rapture. I can't tell you how many times I get that. There's no rapture, and then they sign off and go away. They don't give me verses to show me there's no rapture whatever they just in the white space here though there would be tribulation they will deliver you up to tribulation tribulation means wrath that's the day of the lord read joel again um and the church is not appointed unto wrath we, we read that if you want to read on your own first thessalonians chapter four and chapter five Revelation 3.10, those are all things that have to do with specifically wrath. Actually, uh, there's first Thessalonians 1. Listen. There's a phrase or two in there. So, if you want to read on your own, read that. But, I mean, pertaining just to wrath. Um, there's more. But anyway, that's those are good places to start. So, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Now, he's speaking to his uh, the four disciples there. Well, he's talking to Jews. Well, he was talking to Jews in the previous chapter. He is talking to Jews here, but he's talking to Christian Jews, right? He's talking to believers, okay? But he's speaking to Jews, and I'll say, okay, I'll bite. He's speaking to Jews. Great. So the Jews will be there in the tribulation, right? Um, this is the book, Matthew, the only gospel where the church is mentioned, by the way, I would point out. Jesus chose the Holy Spirit when he inspired the writers to write the Gospels. Matthew was inspired to quote Jesus one time when he was talking about, two times when he was talking about church. Jesus announces church and gives a couple phrases that have to do with church in Matthew. So anyway, so if you want to say Matthew's all about Jews, there's no church in Matthew. 
Got to deal with that. Anyway. Um, so anyway, yeah, he's speaking to Jews. Okay. So I'm just showing you both sides to look at this. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Well, now that it can be still be about Israel. You know, one time you used to be able to say, well, they were pretty tolerant of and we're okay, pretty okay with Christians here in the United States, but um, for the most part, but mm, no more. And then verse 10, many will be offended. I'm so offended. Uh, who is, everybody's offended now, right? Good grief. Many will be offended and they'll betray one another. Contact tracing app, you know, hey, hey, this guy here not wearing his mask. Uh, they'll be offended. They'll betray one another. I think there'll be contract, taste, contact tracing apps for believers in the tribulation. They'll have apps. This is a guy here sharing the gospel. Over here, I'm at the 7-Eleven on this street. and the, You know, you know, um, and they'll hate one another. Well, we're already there as far as that goes. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophets today? <clears throat> um, and because lawlessness will abound. Lawlessness? Our streets are peaceful. Come on. Just not, that's a protest. That's not lawlessness. All the banking, breaking into things and stealing money and tennis shoes and TVs. That's not law. That's, that's a protest. Uh, the love of many will grow cold. No, no, we're all so loving. We don't, you know, don't be judgy. Okay. But he who endures to the end, the end of what? What's the context? He who endures to the end of the tribulation, okay, shall be saved. So there will be, what this tells us is that there will be people who survive the tribulation. He who endures to the end shall be saved. And what's going to happen, what else happens during this tribulation period he's talking about here is this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Now, some people say, oh, the gospel's got to preach, be preached to all the world and all the nations before there's a rapture. No, the context is verse 9, the tribulation. So that stuff does not have to happen before there's a rapture. Uh, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Verse 9. Now we got verse 14. Context is tribulation. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness. And who's doing the witnessing? Well, you got the 144,000 for one thing, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. Um, that's in Revelation chapter 7. Um, and they're all sealed. And then the end will come. So, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come, the end of tribulation. Now, I would say, let's take an, another look at three before we close out of this section here. Here they're privately talking to Jesus and they're asking this question. Tell us, there's three things here. In these two sentences. When will all these things be? So they're asking the when. When will all these things be? When, when's that going to be? And what will be the sign of your coming? So they're asking for signs. What's going to be the sign of your coming? So they're asking about second coming. Now, when are you coming back? What's, what's going to be that sign? Okay. And of the end of the age. So they, they don't realize that there's a lot of overlap there. So Jesus is going to, in this chapter, he's going to be answering those questions and he's going to be answering them in order. Now, I would say, I would point out too, that when it comes to the end and you're coming and then the end will come, um, unless those days be shortened. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. People gather together after the tribulation of those days. This is going to happen. And they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. So the end and the second coming type stuff are mentioned something like 13 times. If you if you just look at Matthew 24, maybe I was counting in Matthew 25 as well. I'm not sure. I don't recall. But over a dozen times, the end and the second coming are mentioned. So you can't read Matthew 24, verse 1, and read all the way to the end of Matthew 24 or into chapter 25 and read a chronology starting from the beginning of 
these events, whether it's tribulation or whatever, however you want to look at it, and and looking all the way in the uh, to the conclusion of these things, it's not one straightforward chronology. So you got a little nugget of context, and then another little nugget, nugget in this subject here, and in this subject here, and there'll be some overlap and some cross mentioning some of the same time periods in here. So unfortunately, that's that's just the way it is. But he's answering their questions and he's trying to answer them in the order that they were asked. Um, so, again, about, you say, um, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and reading between the lines. We can do that, and we do it all the time in Scripture, because we know some events are laid out, and we know when some things are going to happen. But I, there's some things that he mentions here, too, that although he, the word rapture is not in Matthew 24, no, but between the lines and in the, in the subtext of what's being discussed, it's there, just like in the subtext we're reading about temple, right? Because we're reading about the abomination of desolation and all these things. And he's talking about temple. Well, the word temple is not even in that chapter. See, subtext can mention things um, indirectly because we know what he's talking about. The Antichrist isn't mentioned either. Let's say anything about Antichrist. It says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Well, the abomination of desolation was you know, that which abominated, I mean, it was the statue of Zeus. And it was desecrated as well by, you know, there was a false prophet in the temple, sure. You know, a type of Antichrist, obviously. Uh, and, you know, he did that. And then we also had, um, you know, this, the, you know, the same dude also uh, sacri sacrificed the pigs. Uh, to statues on the altar, to statues of himself um, that were designed to look like him. So he was worshipped there in the temple and so forth. So that's Antiochus Epiphanes. So, um, or Epiphanes, sorry. It's Antiochus Epiphanes. So, um, I just have an epiphany. Antiochus Epiphanes. So, um, anyway, I'm getting silly now. So, um, there is subtext, and you can do that. It's legitimate, and I'm just pointing out some things, and I'm doing it in a silly way to demonstrate that it, it is a thing when you're exegeting Scripture, and you can set up timings and things, and logic. Logic is definitely legitimate hermeneutic when you're talking about Scripture, because logically God is not going to do something illogical and contradict himself from one passage to the other. Synthesis is... All the Bible is written by the same, ultimately the same author. It's not all by the same writer. We've had several writers, you know, over 40 writers, but all authored um, in the big picture by the Holy Spirit with various writers who authored a few books. So we're going to end, we're going to end there at verse 14 and then pick up from there. Um, because from there we're going to get into the abomination of desolation of Daniel. We're not going to go into Daniel. We're not going to break down the 70 weeks of Daniel or anything by any means. Because to try to jam all that and fit it into here is madness. So uh, we will stop at this point and pick up later.